Good morning, and welcome to All Things Marcellus with me, Attorney Doug Clark of the Clark Law Firm. I am located at 1563 Main Street in Peckville, and I am here every Sunday from 8 to 9 a.m. on these stations to provide landowners valuable information you need regarding natural gas development here in Pennsylvania. And if you are looking for land owner information, well, this is the radio show for you. Now, at the Clark Law Firm, my focus is solely on landowner representation, and I have and continue to represent clients and landowners for such items as gas lease negotiations, pipeline and waterline agreements, royalty and royalty deduction issues, more and more estate planning, uh, unitization issues, well pad agreements, surface use agreements, essentially any and all contract related to the Marcella Shell development here in Pennsylvania, as well as again these royalty issues. And we're going to talk more about, I encourage everybody to stay tuned for the, over the next couple of weeks because I think um, you're going to find those shows uh, very interesting and there's going to be a lot of very important information that I think everybody should be paying attention to. But that's not today, that's in the next uh, upcoming weeks. So really encourage you, make sure, keep tuning in because I think you're going to find this information uh, very important and interesting. And of course, if you do need representation for any of these items, always feel free to contact me directly at 570-307-0702. That's 570-307-0702. Check out the websites at pagasleaseattorney.com, pipelineattorney.com, and I have, and I promise they are coming. And we're hoping by uh, the beginning of the year, but we have some uh, major renovations going to the website. The mock-ups are done, working on some major, major improvements, and I think uh, everyone's going to enjoy and, and get more information out there to the landowners in Pennsylvania. So, okay, uh, if you haven't heard the show before, if you want to listen to any of the prior shows, I've been doing the show since August of 2010. So you can go check out at pagasleaseattorney.com. You can go check out prior radio shows there. You can go ahead and check out uh, on YouTube. We're on YouTube now. You can type in All Things Marcellus and also on iTunes. If you type in in the podcast, All Things Marcellus, you can check us out on iTunes there as well. And follow us on uh, Twitter. You can go to Doug Clark Law, at Doug Clark Law, and also check us out on Facebook as well. Okay, got those things out of the way here to start. And what I want to do, you know, if you're a regular listener and, and if not, what I try to do, I look and I see, you know, hey, what's going on this week? Did something new come up? Uh, have, is there a hot topic that I think landowners need to be know, know about or be thinking about? And this week, uh, it was over the last week, maybe it was the last two weeks, but I got a new, uh, a new agreement that a client sent to me and said, hey, can you help me out with this agreement? And you know, we don't see this very often, but this was actually uh, an agreement that I hadn't seen before. Now, many of the terms are the same as far as how they're constructed and, you know, very familiar with the whole formatting of the document, the items uh, that are being addressed. It's an easement agreement. But this particular request is something I hadn't seen before. So, you know, I don't know if this is going to be something that catches on, if there's going to be more of these agreements. But as I say all the time, I'm going to go through this agreement and whether you ever have an agreement like this, and this agreement is called a Surface Site and Cathodic Protection Easement. Surface Site and Cathodic Protection Easement. All right, you may say, what in the world is that? Most important, let's focus on the fact that this is an easement agreement. Okay, it's an easement agreement. Also, let's focus on the fact that we see the words surface site surface not below ground but surface so this is a surface site and cathodic protection easement cathodic protection is what pipeline companies use to help prevent corrosion and rust of the pipelines so this is a surface site and cathodic protection easement again you may say well, well, why do I even need to keep listening what, what's ever gonna happen I'm never gonna see something like that well as with most agreements, and certainly with all these easement agreements, 
the same considerations apply, the same concerns apply, the same things we need to be looking at uh, apply. So whether you have a pipeline agreement or a waterline agreement, a surface site agreement, a well pad agreement, all of these same concerns apply. But here we see, okay, well this document is constructed very similar, uh, similarly to other documents, but it's different. So let's let's go ahead and let's dive into this surface site and cathodic protection easement. And this one was provided to a landowner by Williams. I believe this is in Susquehanna. Yes, Susquehanna County. Okay. So as with all of these easement agreements, it starts off with identifying the party, saying that this surface site and cathodic protection easement is made on this blank day, whatever day it is, and it's done between and then we'll have the landowner listed as the grantor. Remember, if you are the grantor, you are granting something. So the landowner is the grantor. And then it goes ahead and lists Williams Field Services Company as the grantee. The party getting something. Grantor granting. Grantee receiving. Okay, so that's the first paragraph. Second paragraph says, for in consideration of the sum of $100, and you know that's important in this agreement because that's saying what they're going to be giving you up front. They're going to be getting one hundred dollars. Now, a lot of times, see, in contract law, you need to state some sort of consideration in the agreement. So that's why you'll see sometimes deeds, or you'll see these documents saying for for in consideration of one dollar or a hundred dollars, things like that. Well, you have to be careful because sometimes that's just stated consideration. And then you lay out in other separate side letters or side agreements what the actual overall consideration is going to be. But sometimes that number is going to only be or be your guaranteed consideration. So you want to be careful and you want to be looking at that and understand, well, if I sign this, am I guaranteed more consideration or more money in the future? Or if I sign this, is this initial payment all I'm going to receive? In other words, is this going to be an option agreement where I get, say for example, $100 and if the company decides not to use this agreement, I do not receive any more money? Or is this a straight agreement where if I sign it, I'm not only going to get this $100 as stated here, but I'm also going to get the additional consideration or money that's set forth in a side letter or separate agreement. Very important that you understand those terms very important. You don't want to sit there and think, oh, I'm going to get 15, 20, 30, whatever, 40, 50 thousand dollars. And in fact, you get a hundred dollars when you sign and then you never see any other money because it was an option agreement and the company decided not to exercise the option. I've talked about that option agreement and that landowner dilemma, I call it, so much because I think it's, it's one of the most fundamental things that you have to look at instantly as a landowner. If you see an agreement and it says option in the agreement, and usually it says in the heading, please be very, very careful and understand, hey, red flags should be going up everywhere. Not so, Most of my clients you know, will sign option agreements, or they sign option agreements, so I'm not saying you don't do it, but I'm telling you it needs to be done the right way, you need to understand it, because sometimes you can get more money placed up front, so in the event the company doesn't use it in the future, well, at least you got this money up front to make it worth your while. You want to at least cover all your fees and expenses in dealing with the document, and certainly you want to do much better than that. I am Attorney Doug Clark. You're listening to All Things Marcellus. I'm here every Sunday from 8 to 9 a.m. talking about this new agreement, or well, agreement that I've seen now here for the first time, a surface site and cathodic protection easement. So I went through the first paragraph, just identifies the parties. The second paragraph, and this is what we call the granting paragraph. Remember, you as the landowner, the grantor, the party granting something, and the company is the grantee, the party receiving something. So when you're giving something, certainly you should be getting a benefit. Usually that's going to be compensation or money. But what are you giving? And this is the granting. Here we go. So what are you granting? So we said for in consideration of $100, and again, talked about the side letters, could be more money involved than that, goes on to say grantor, meaning you, does hereby grant and convey to grantee or the company its successors and assigns, remember, this thing will go on potentially forever unless you have language in there limiting the length of time, 
So it goes on to state that in the assigns, meaning they could also assign it. So you could enter this deal with Williams and they could sell their company. They could assign this uh, easement to another company. You just need to be aware of that. Very common, but you need to be aware of it. So it says that you're granting them and their successors and assigns up to a 20 foot by 475 foot surface easement. All right, 20 feet wide, not terribly wide, but 20 feet wide by 475 feet. So that's a you know, football field, a little more than a football field and a half. So 20 feet wide by 475 feet. It's pretty long. So you're granting them up to 20 foot by 475, a surface easement. Okay above ground, the surface easement. To do what? Well, to install, operate, maintain, repair, alter, replace, and remove equipment for the purpose of applying cathodic protection to its pipelines. Okay. Um, we're granting those those rights to operate, maintain, repair, alter, replace, and remove equipment. Okay, equipment. Well, what kind of equipment is this going to be? We better figure that out. Equipment for the purpose of applying cathodic protection to its pipelines. Again, cathodic protection being this is typically an electrical current is going to be a very low level to run through the pipelines to prevent rust and corrosion. Including but not limited to. So it goes on and says, okay, this equipment, these rights are including but not limited to a rectifier. Well, you better know what that is. Anode bed, should know what that is. Associated wiring, okay, wiring, uh, we know what that is. And related facilities, and related facilities. Well, if we don't know what a rectifier or an anode bed is, well, do we know what related facilities might be? Goes on to state fences, fittings, electrical lines, electrical lines. Remember, this is a surface site. Electrical lines, utility lines, communication equipment. Now pay attention. Electrical slash utility poles. So we're talking about electric or utility poles above ground here, guy wires, and other necessary appurtenances and accessories. All right, let me go back there. So remember, this is 20 feet wide by 475 feet, and it's going to allow them to again, replace, repair, alter uh, equipment for the purposes of applying cathodic protection to its pipelines. And it goes on to state, you know, including but not limited to rectifier, anode bed, and associated wiring and related facilities, fences, fittings, electrical lines, utility lines, communication equipment, electrical and utility poles, guy wires, and other necessary appurtenances and accessories. Well, you better know what those might be. And the reality is, how are you going to know? You know what type of other necessity, appurtenances, and accessories may the company need? You need want to make sure you're asking these questions. And you need to make sure that you're always balancing the compensation with the uncertainty. Then it goes on. Well, you know what? I'm up against here. I'm going to, I'm going to finish this granting clause when we get back after this break. Uh, pay, stay tuned. You know, this is the same thing, whether it's a pipeline, whether it's a well site, whether it's any surface or even subsurface, any easement agreement. You need to be thinking about these things. You as the grantor are granting. The company is receiving. You better know when you're granting something, you need to know what you're granting. And you need to know whether you can limit what you're going to grant. Usually you can, and you want to make sure you are doing that. I am Attorney Doug Clark. You're listening to All Things Marcellus here every Sunday from 8 to 9 a.m. and going to be right back after this break. Welcome back to All Things Marcellus with me, Attorney Doug Clark of the Clark Law Firm. And a reminder, you can always contact me directly at 570-307-0702. That's 570-307-0702. And if you miss any of today's show, 
Or you want to go back, you want to listen to some of the other shows. Been doing the radio show since August of 2010. So go check out PA Gas Lease Attorney.com. Check out Pipeline Attorney.com. Whether you're looking for representation or not, I believe they are very good resources. We get a lot of compliment compliments with the uh, content on the websites and really encourage you to check them out. It's a great starting point to learn some more information and I guess <laughs> hopefully it's more of a starting point than just a starting point because there are uh, 170 some or more uh, hours of radio shows uh, available on a website. So again, that's pagasleaseattorney.com, pipelineattorney.com. Check us out on Twitter at Doug Clark Law. Tweet out articles and information there you may find useful. Um, I want to jump back into it here. So we're talking about a surface site and cathodic protection easement agreement, an agreement that I hadn't seen before uh, until just within the last week or so. And this particular agreement was offered by Williams in Susquehanna County uh, here in northeastern Pennsylvania. So just taking a step back, and I know I said it before, I know they say this often, but just bear with me that these concerns aren't just limited to this document. So anytime you're given an easement agreement, and I don't care if you're in Susquehanna County or if you're in Washington or Greene County, wherever you are, you need to be thinking about these things. And I believe with confidence you should be getting assistance to make sure you're not missing something. You want to make sure that you're maximizing your circumstances and you want to make sure that you're protecting yourself in the future because there are a lot of hidden tricks and secrets in almost all of these documents in almost all of them so please make sure that you're being careful okay jumping back to the surface site and cathodic protection easement agreement so i said here that we're still on page one first paragraph introduces the parties second paragraph says what you as the grantor are granting to the company who is the grantee. So we said it's going to be a 20 foot wide up to 20 feet wide and 475 feet in length. It's a surface easement and they are allowed as part of this easement. You're granting the company the ability to have these related facilities which are very diff difficult to understand what they are but fences fittings, electrical lines, utility lines, communication equipment, electrical and utility poles, guy wires, and other necessary appurtenances and accessories. Who's going to determine what those are? Not you. Other necessity, or excuse me, other necessary appurtenances and accessories. Those are going to be determined by the company. So you're really opening yourself up to above ground items, electrical poles, uh, utility poles, and other things which you probably have no idea what they even are. So okay, well, maybe that's that's something you're able to just go ahead and say, okay, I can do that. Well, then it goes on to say that the company also has, together with the right to use and or construct, to use and or construct a roadway and or a power connection there too and to access the same and they call it a CP the letters CP for cathodic protection site on the following described land so not only are you giving them this easement you are giving them the right to use and or construct a roadway and or a power connection there too so remember, I can't say this enough. You know, I've been saying this a lot. I'm going to keep saying it because it's something that people aren't understanding and it's certainly something that companies aren't telling people. Um, roadways can take property and will, in almost all cases, relative to gas production, take that portion of your property out of the clean and green program. So if all of a sudden there's a roadway built, you didn't factor this in and you didn't get any additional compensation and you don't have clean and green protection and usually that clean and green protection is only for back taxes and penalties well if that roadway consisted of a half an acre area well that half acre is most cases going to come out of clean and green and you're going to have to pay heightened taxes every year as long as that roadway is there so if it's a half an acre now right now Susquehanna County is only using the fair market value of this property for taxing purposes however Several counties 
are using the commercial tax rate for these gas activities. So what we've seen and called different counties, called the tax bureaus, doing some research. And what we find is those tax rates are typically in the commercial between $1,000 and $1,500 per acre. So just using an example, if a roadway is a half an acre and you're in a situation where you're going to be taxed at a commercial rate and you used to being clean and green, number one, you're going to have penalties and back taxes because the property is going to be taken out of the clean and green this half acre in this example. But then also, each year, that half acre, if you're in a, a county that's going to use the commercial tax rate, is going to be taxed at either 1000 or $1,500 per acre. So let's say it's 1000 Well, a half an acre, half of 1000 $500. You're now, every year, going to have to pay $500 in additional taxes because of this roadway, where you may not even realize that there might even be a roadway under the terms of the agreement. You don't know where it's going to be. You don't know. <laughs> so you're giving this right to a roadway and exposing yourself to these taxes, and it's something that you have to understand and you have to be thinking about. And somebody can please call my office if a landman ever came to them and said hey by the way uh, we might put a roadway in too because we have that ability and if we do yeah you might have some penalties and rollbacks if your property is in clean and green um, also yeah as long as this roadway is there if it's a permanent roadway going to our facilities well you know you're also probably gonna have to pay taxes every year based upon the size of this roadway and yeah, you know, if it's $500 a year and that's 10 years, that's $5,000. And hey, you know, we're only offering you, you know, $1,000 maybe for a certain agreement. Well, you know, you got to be aware of these things. I mean, some of these things just don't make sense. And what's going to happen is, and because that we're in this part now where landowners are signing roadway agreements for $750, not realizing it's very possible in a few years from now they're going to get a notice from the uh, county tax assessor saying, hey, by the way, uh, you lose your clean and green status here. You owe penalties and back taxes. Oh, and you're now out of clean and green with this property or this portion of your property. So you got to be aware of that. And because it's not happening yet, no one's talking about it. But it's going to happen. And no one's telling, you know, the companies aren't telling you this. And you know, hopefully a lot of people are listening to the show and they'll be out there telling people. But it's killing me because I just really think this is an area where a lot of people are going to get burned and be very disappointed. I am Attorney Doug Clark. This is All Things Marcellus. I'm here every Sunday from 8 to 9 a.m. We're talking about surface site and cathodic protection easement. And it's an agreement presented to a landowner. Same principles apply to surface site agreement, pipeline agreement, any it's almost any other type of uh, agreement aside from like a lease agreement that you can get here in Pennsylvania. So okay, so we, that was the granting clause. And as you've heard, you know you're granting a lot of rights there. You know, you're granting a lot. So when you're granting a lot, remember what are you receiving? Well, you're going to be receiving compensation or money. So there's always going to be this balance of at some point in time there may be enough money to make this process worth it to you. What is that point? And that's where you really need to be understanding what are they going to do and what's going to happen to my property. If it's going to be a 10 foot by 10 foot area, nothing's above ground, well, hey, what's the big deal? Maybe that's something you agree to pretty cheaply. But if it's going to be 20 feet by 475 feet, and you're going to have electric poles, utility poles, fences, things above ground, you know what your price may be a lot higher and you know pretty much i mean at some point you know maybe you know <laughs> you, know, you can get crazy and say well all right well i, I wouldn't do it money's not a factor if they say well here's 10 million dollars well you know maybe you do it so the question is is where is that spot that you can agree but then also how can you limit what they want to do because a lot of times what you see is you'll see these um, requests for utility pools or lines and maybe we can get those knocked out of the agreement because remember this company can assign or transfer these rights so we want to make sure that you know maybe that's not the intention today but maybe in 10 years 5 years 20 years those intentions change maybe a different company holds this easement 
their intentions are different what they want to do is different so if you can take care of that today you can avoid these potential problems in the future okay moving on here to the agreement says that the cathodic protection site described shall be constructed as depicted on the sketch labeled as the exhibit map attached here to and made here a part here of okay constructed and depicted all right you know i'm going to tell you i mean i'd like to see um a little more details on that and of course we have to look at at the exhibit map and see what they say and we'll get to that we're going to be touching on that here in a minute goes on to state that grantor or you agrees to cooperate in obtaining any permits um, licenses approvals driveway permits and that's usually oh, here electrical easements zoning and land use permits usually what companies are looking for there usually but they want to obviously cover everything uh, sometimes they're going to need a driveway permit and they need the landowner to sign off on that so that's what they're really in most cases trying to get to well that's also always an indicator well why do they want you to do that because remember maybe they're going to construct a roadway here maybe they're going to construct a roadway you need to be thinking about that it's just some small little sentence but there's some other indicators saying that hey that's really a possibility that that could occur okay it goes on to state that grantee all right pay attention here again grantee company shall have reasonable use of grantors land for access during construction grantee shall have reasonable use well reasonable to who to you to them grantee company shall have reasonable use to the landowner's land for access during and after construction so maybe you think they're being unreasonable they think they're being reasonable how are you going to address that are you going to end up having to go into court and fight that out how's that going to be handled so you want to make sure that you're understanding that i mean that's a potential problem there for you that the company shall have reasonable use of your land during and after construction grantee or company agrees to restore the property disturbed by its operations until and, and so that the same or excuse me operations here under to the same state or better than existed prior to the commencement of their operations so in other words they're gonna make it back to the condition it was or better very standard language I mean, we see this all the time so okay I mean, not bad that's good there's you know we'd like to add some more to that how it's gonna be done but you know that's a uh, pretty standard stuff okay goes on the next paragraph the landowner is warranting and defending their title in the property and if anybody ever makes a claim of ownership of the property well the landowner is gonna have to defend that um, and you're warranting that you have this title usually we can get rid of that it's very simple and it's usually done with just an additional addendum term goes on to state that it's going to be the, the surface site the actual agreement is going to be recorded but there will be a separate letter agreement remember we talked about that earlier separate letter agreement talking about compensation how much money you're going to get can we now put some other terms in that document such as how are they going to reclaim it what about these roadways can they have above ground electrical and utility poles what can we do they're going to, is this whole area going to be fenced what are we going to do here and that's going to be our opportunity through a separate agreement a separate addendum whatever that case may be but remember very important this document the actual agreement is going to be filed at the courthouse but not your separate letter agreement so in five ten years twenty years thirty years um, you better make sure that you have possession of that agreement because it's not going to be filed at the courthouse and that's going to be a problem for a lot of people in years to come all right just finishing this up then just goes on to state that it can be signed in what they call counterparts meaning that the one party can sign it separately than the other you know landowner signs it company signs it each of the signed documents represents the original so often you're not going to get a copy of the document back so we want to make sure we always try to make sure that we're going to get signed copies back from the company okay that's it that's the agreement but there is a separate letter agreement we get back i'm going to talk about that again i am attorney doug clark you're listening to all things marcellus here every sunday from 8 to 9 a.m and i will be right back after this break 
Welcome back to All Things Marcellus with me, Attorney Doug Clark of the Clark Law Firm. Also remember, I am here every Sunday from 8 to 9 a.m. on these stations. You can check out PA Gas Lease Attorney.com, Pipeline Attorney.com. On the Gas Lease site, we have the radio shows archived dating back to August of 2010. So check out PA Gas Lease Attorney.com. And also, we're putting up the shows right away. So starting tomorrow morning. So if you're joining now, you missed the first part of the show, or hey, you can't tune in um, from 8 to 9 a.m. every Sunday, or you live in a different area where you don't get reception, you can check out the websites. You can go pagasleaseattorney.com tomorrow. We post them up first thing Monday morning. We want to make sure everybody has immediate access. Uh, so check that out as well. So and those will be up all week and it will be up forever. So you don't have to tune in every morning at 8 to 9 a.m. We certainly welcome you to do so every Sunday morning, that is. But check out pagasleaseattorney.com. Okay, getting back to just went through the Surface Site and Cathodic Protection Easement Agreement. And that was the document. That's it. So what happens is there's a separate side letter agreement. Remember, compensation. You're granting a lot. We went through all the different things that you're granting to the company as the grantor. What are you going to be receiving in exchange? Well, it's going to be money. And what do you want to make sure you're doing? You want to make sure that you're maximizing any financial benefit. You need to make sure that the financial benefit is going to outweigh what's going to occur in the property, what rights you're giving up. You don't want to enter into an agreement and then be surprised. We want to make sure that, hey, if they say we need the right to have utility poles, we need to have electrical poles, we need guy wires, we need all these things above ground, we need to fence off this area. Well, if they say they need to do that, well, maybe that means in order for you to agree to this, you need to increase your compensation request. But if they say, hey, yeah, we don't need to have any above ground pools. We don't need guy wires. We don't need other items that we had indicated in this uh, easement agreement that we were requesting. Well, then let's put it in the agreement and then the price may come down. But that's all an individual um, you know, choice. If you have a property and this is all going in your front yard, you know, why would you even consider it? Well, and then you're going to be in that area where they better be offering me a lot of money for me to even entertain this. Likewise, you don't want to get involved into some sort of lengthy, timely or uh, time-consuming and expensive negotiations or discussions if this is something you're not going to agree to if they're never going to offer you enough money. You got to be thinking about all of these things very early on in the process. I say it all the time: location and compensation. We need to determine, is this going to be in a location that you can deal with, that it's going to be acceptable to you? And then we also need to understand, is this financially something that you're interested in pursuing? Because if they're not going to meet your financial terms, then why engage in this process and incur uh, expenses and spend time on it if you're never going to reach an agreement? All right, so let's talk about the Surface Site and Cathodic Protection Easement Separate Letter Agreement. Well, the agreement itself is uh, just over half a page. The separate letter agreement, first thing it does, identify the parties. Second thing it does, says, hey, there's going to be uh, consideration. It's going to be granted here. And then it goes on to state the payment terms. So this one says, and I'm going to say the exact amount here, but this offer says prior to the commencement of construction, so before they start constructing this surface site, the company will pay the landowner a certain amount of money. And that shall constitute full and final payment for the easement. So let me repeat that. This is critical. Prior to commencement of construction, the company agrees to pay you a certain amount of money. You know, and I'm just not going to state the money that's in this agreement here for privacy reasons. But they're going to offer you blank money, and that's all you get. That's full and final payment for this easement. So that better be enough money. Now, the other thing that's very concerning to me is, remember, we talked about that you got $100 uh, was what the consideration was in the initial document. Well, you're not getting this second payment if or until they commence construction. 
Well, when is that going to be? Is this document, is this thing be able to sit out here for 10 years, 20 years, five years? You sign this agreement, when are they going to start construction? You need to have this defined. When is this going to occur? You don't want to just sign this document and sit out there for years. <laughs> and that gets me to the point, you know, it kills me. Every single time it kills me. Um, you know, they say everybody is in a hurry. And here's a little secret, ladies and gentlemen. These companies very, very often put arbitrary deadline dates out there in order to get people to sign. They'll say to you, we need to get the gas to market. We need to get the gas to market. That's where the big money is. That's where the royalty is. We need to get the gas to market. Here, hurry up and sign. Hurry up and sign. And you say, well, hey, man, uh, land man, why is there a, uh, a five-year option here that you have five years to decide if you're going to do this or not? Um, in a case like this, if this is a if this is an important document, well, how come we're not going to, why not just pay me all this money up front and set a time frame that you have to start construction in two years or a year? If everything is such a hurry, if you got guys standing there in shovels, I'll tell you what, it's funny. I hear that all the time. I, I'm going to take a ride all through Bradford County and Susquehanna County maybe this, maybe next weekend. <laughs> I'll take a ride and see how many guys are standing around with shovels in their hands because that's what the companies are saying is, oh, yeah, these guys, uh, we got these guys standing around with shovels. I got to see it. I got to drive around and see all of these people standing around with shovels because li landowners haven't signed fast enough. You know, what I've seen is time and time again, how important everything is, how important everything is, and a landowner sign, and very rarely does construction commence in very short order. And usually if that is the case, we have information that tells us that, that is a legitimate situation. Um, but when you hear these things about hurry, 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 please understand that rarely is there this need for some crazy hurry. Now, if you've been engaged in negotiations and discussions for a very long time, and at some point in time, things need to get going. But typically, when you're approached right at the beginning, uh, very rarely is there a need for a big hurry. And then also, again, look at the option time frame. How much time does the company want after you sign to even decide what to do? And that's an indicator. You know, if it's five years after you sign before they even decide if they want to use it, say, hey, company, why don't you make that one year or two years since you're in such a hurry and see how they respond to that. Okay, back to this agreement, though. In this particular case, this says we're going to give you this $100 when you sign, but then goes on to talk about that prior to commencement of operations here, we're going to give you the second payment, which will be the full and final payment. Well, I would like to see that payment scheduled that construction must start in a certain time frame and the payment must be made in a certain time frame. You're going through this expense and cost and through this hassle. You now have an agreement filed on your title and you don't even know when they're going to commence, if they're going to commence to work. So you need to be addressing those type of issues. I am Attorney Doug Clark. This is All Things Marcellus. I'm here every Sunday from 8 to 9 a.m. Check out pagasleaseattorney.com, pipelineattorney.com. Been doing a radio show and we have them archived up there since August of 2010. All right, back to this separate letter agreement. So, okay, we want to try to get some time frames in here. I don't like the way that's constructed at all. Then it goes on to say that if you as the landowner own less than the property or the whole property, then that payment will be reduced. And, you know, hey, that's fine. Um, you know, if you don't, if it's you and your sibling or something like that, or if somebody else is claiming that they have some ownership. But, um, you know, rarely that comes into play, but that's something that needs to be discussed. And we would certainly talk about that in the process of representation. In any event, okay, and then it goes on to state, and this is a very common term, but just something to be aware of because this term can be used uh, with regarding the payments. And this term is no default. No default shall be declared for failure to make payment until 30 days after written notice from grantor or landowner of intention to declare such default. Let me explain what that means. So we talked about you get this $100 payment. Then you have another payment which will be made prior to the company starting operations on your property. We don't know when that will occur, if it will occur. 
Um, but that's the time when you would get your second payment. So say here you are, you go up, maybe it's a property, or it's a recreational property, you go up and you look and you say, oh man, wow, these guys not out, they've started work on my property. Or they've started work and finished, or they're almost finished, any of those things. And you say, you know what, I didn't get my second payment, my big payment, the reason why I entered into this. You can't say, hey, you defaulted on my agreement. What you have to do is write a letter and notify the company, hey, you didn't pay me. And the company then has 30 days from receipt of this letter in order to pay you. So I'm not saying when we typically don't do this, this is usually a catch-all here for the company. But what happens is, is they're supposed to pay you prior to commencement of operations. Well, if they forget, if there's an oversight, well, you have to write to them and they have another 30 days. So just you need to be aware of that and it just falls back into you're given a lot of rights here. And why shouldn't you get paid either, you know, within a certain definite time frame or those rights expire and the company this agreement is null and void or get that money up front and require the construction has to occur within a certain time frame. So very important that you're aware of that term and it can be used and we see it some, you know, we see it sometimes in gas leases where, com where landowners aren't paid quick enough. And, you know, better companies, more reputable companies, you may have an oversight, things of that nature. Um, but some of these other companies, I worry about um, manipulating these numbers. You know, and I talked about some of these gas leases that you see out there by companies that either are newly formed or haven't uh, produced any gas, really. You want to look at those. You just want to make sure you're comfortable with that because you got to watch. And the longer that period is, the more nervous that it makes me. I want to be clear though. I'm not saying, in my opinion, and I haven't seen Williams, um, you know, not pay in order to manipulate uh, any of these agreements. But I'm saying that you need to be aware of that. And I, I don't think that they would. And I think that if there was a a payment that was late or wasn't made, it was probably an oversight. But I think in an agreement like this, you should never be in that circumstance. There should be a date certain of payment, and there should be a time certain in which operations must commence. And you may even have a time frame when they have to end, but you must have those in the agreement. Otherwise, you know, worst case scenario, you get a hundred bucks and this thing sits out there for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You know, we don't, we didn't even get to the fact that there's no termination of this agreement. When does it actually end? I am attorney Doug Clark. You're listening to all things Marcellus. I'm here every Sunday from eight to 9 a.m. We're talking about a cathodic or surface site and cathodic protection easement going through this separate letter agreement which is an additional agreement so it's like this separate little side agreement which is fine it's legal it's appropriate and we're going through last section here on their printed form is actually there's two more sections but the last one is okay where's this going to be located well it says that the grantor landowner approves the location generally depicted in the exhibit map of the easement of this same date for installation of the site. This is something that just drives me crazy. You approve the location generally depicted in the map. You better be comfortable with that. You better be comfortable with generally approving a location. Goes on to state that with the understanding that a more precise depiction of the final location of the surface site may supersede the sketch and may be subsequently recorded by the company. So you got to be comfortable with the map and with the idea that this is a general depiction. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into it today because I have the pipeline stuff. I was gonna jump to this today, but I think there's too many other things. We'll see if I have enough time in the next segment. But location, location, location everyone please be careful with location watch these cartoon maps that do not clearly depict location unless you're comfortable with the understanding that that location may change location is unbelievably important you need to lock it down as much as you can and if you don't have it locked down completely you need to be comfortable with the fact that that company is going to have some leeway and has some ability to move this thing around. Very important. You're listening to All Things Marcellus with me, Attorney Doug Clark, here every Sunday from 8 to 9. I'm going to be right back after this break. 
Welcome back to All Things Marcellus with me, Attorney Doug Clark, again here every Sunday from 8 to 9 a.m. And you can check out the radio shows. We have them archived on PA Gas Lease attorney.com you can also go to youtube started putting the radio shows up there as well so if you missed any of today's show we can go back check out any of the shows through or from excuse me from august 2010 all the way up until today's show you can check those out on pa gas lease attorney.com and again we started to put them up on youtube recently as well all right, you know, I'm going to break a little bit here because I wanted to you know I talked about that location fired up a little bit about that because what I'm going to do this is again this is a really big issue for me for my clients and I want to make sure for everybody that we're really understanding you know this flexibility that's often built into these agreements. So here's an example. I'm going to jump to a pipeline map. So this is a map that's attached, an exhibit map attached to an agreement. Now you have to watch, number one, these maps, sometimes there'll be language in the agreement that, hey, here's where we're going to put the pipeline, but we can change it subject to your approval, but you can't be unreasonable in granting your approval. Well, be very, very careful of that. Very careful of that. Not gonna, I could do a whole show on it, and probably I will sometime here in the future, but please be very careful of that. But here's something, here's some language that's in a option to purchase pipeline easement exhibit map. It says that the grantor or landowner approves the location of the easement across the grantor or landowner's property, more specifically shown below. Okay, that sounds good. I'm going to approve this as part of the agreement. I'm going to have this map. Remember, we want the best map possible. Any change in the location of the easement must be approved by the landowner in writing. Spectacular. That's exactly what we want. Please, when you read that, don't stop reading. The next sentence says, Grantor understands that the easement route may involve civil, cultural, environmental, and other types of surveys to comply with local, state, and federal government, governmental agency regulations. Okay, yeah, we understand that. You know, sometimes that can already be done. Uh, if the easement is required to be relocated, all right, if the easement is required to be relocated to comply with said regulations, be very careful because they say, okay, well, here's where we're going to put it. They haven't done any surveying or anything like that, and it turns out there's a swamp area and there's wetlands, and they need to move this because of the wetlands in this area. Well, now all of a sudden, you may have a problem. So one reason is to comply with regulations. You know, I wonder do sometimes companies know full well that it's going to move and they just go ahead and throw out a map there without really doing any serious survey work or anything and say, ah, well, hey, if, there's, if we have a, a permitting issue, we'll just move it and we'll put that in the agreement. So please be careful. So one way that it can move is to comply with regulations. Another way, and this one kills me, another way is to avoid major constructability issues. Well, what are those? Who? What does the word major constructability issues mean? So if the company has major constructability issues, then your route can change. Next is avoiding wetlands or threatened or endangered species. You know, look, we say get out there and do some wetland delineation. Get rid of this language. Uh, don't like it at all because you know the route you're presented may never even remotely come close to being a workable route. So then it says, or at the request of said agency, and it goes on to state that the landowner shall grant in writing any reasonable change of the easement route. Again, what in the world is reasonable? They throw you out there a map. You say, oh, okay, hey, yeah, I like that location. That works great. And then find out a year later, sometime later, oh, there's wetlands there, and we need to avoid those. So instead of this route going where you want it, we're going to shift it way down here towards your house or towards an area where you don't want it. And you say, well, I don't want it there. I don't want it there. And they say, well, listen, th this is a reasonable change because it's as close as we can put it to where it was originally designed or originally proposed in the map. 
as close as we can do and be outside of the wetlands or avoid major constructability issues so you know we're being reasonable you're being unreasonable well you better be darn well sure that you understand these things and you need to try to make this locked in lock in location lock in location as much as you possibly can if you don't care you don't care and that's okay but you need to understand most people care that's your decision so if you're fine with it and you don't care where it goes then that's okay but you need to understand when you're signing this what is the flexibility I see this route here where may it move to then it goes on to say and again we want the best possible map some of these maps we see look like cartoons you know, I don't know who's drawing them so it says the below representation of the property is not to scale and the route depicted shows approximate location of the easement again how important is that to you how important is that to you what can change understanding what can change and is this something that you can tolerate and can you can we get this thing flagged and agree that this is exactly where it's going to be and any changes require a written approval which may be withheld for any reason not conditioned on some sort of reasonableness standard so we need to be looking at these things I mean a lot of times we have maps that just show exactly where it's going to be and it can't change different circumstances are different meaning obviously but meaning that in some cases you can do certain things in some cases you can't so you understand in your particular case what the leverage you have is and you maximize it and if you don't like it and you don't have the leverage and there's too much flexibility don't do it I say it all the time to people there are worse things out there than not having a pipeline on your property there are worse things out there than not having a surface site on your property there are much worse things need to be thinking about that I am attorney Doug Clark this is all things Marcellus here every Sunday from 8 to 9 a.m. and I want to go back now jumping back switching gears because obviously again that location stuff drives me crazy and I see people afterwards that are upset and I say uh, I try not to say it in a bad way, but just, you know, geez, if we would have taught before, these problems could have been avoided. Avoid future problems by being careful and understanding today. So, all right, back to this surface site and cathodic protection agreement. Went through the agreement, went through uh, the outline of the side letter on compensation. A few things, and I want to stress these are only a few things we want to make sure we are limiting what you're granting I went through that whole granting paragraph we want to define that we want to carve those things out that they can that the company can do that you're agreeing to them saying one thing means nothing it has to be in the documents so we want to carve out what exactly can occur in your property and you may say well you know they have a right to fence well we don't want a big giant fence running across this whole area they say well we're not going to do that say okay and then put it in the agreement here's another thing you got these pools potentially lines electricity all that stuff well we didn't talk at all about indemnification protection from lawsuits none wasn't in there now they may offer that as part of a side letter agreement but if it isn't there you need to get that again only one term there's a lot of other things that can be done as far as you know compensation and how that compensation is going to outweigh what's going to be done to the property reclamation that roadway that roadway language is crazy in my opinion you can't agree to that roadways how big are they going to be where are they going to be are you going to end up with a roadway that's going to cut your property in half you have to define these things leaving some generic right to a roadway and to use property outside of the easement areas the company needs is crazy you can typically define that you have to do that you have clean and green we talked about that that was never covered there's so many other items that you need to be looking at the time frames when does this end there is no language in there whatsoever 
requiring that this agreement ever ends. So now you've given a 20 by up to 20 by 475 foot easement forever. And that should never occur. My opinion should never occur. All right, I'm up against it. You're listening to All Things Marcellus with me, attorney Doug Clark, here again next Sunday from 8 to 9 a.m. Have a wonderful week, everyone.